screen and then. Great. Well, uh, welcome to this uh, call. What we have done here is set up uh, our first first demo from the work that has been done in NGS, NGI ESIF labs. And we're excited to describe what we have done in, in this project. Basically, there are three projects that have been involved. One with iGrant and automated data agreements, collaborating with Dental Tech, which I'm representing, working with standards interoperability lead, together also with Privacy Ant, which has a privacy program tools and perform uh, DPIA reports. And we're gonna show the connection there. And we have another project from Gattaca, Verifiable Universal Interface, where they've integrated the data agreement in the process of creating uh, proofs. And we also have Human Colossus with the overlays capture architecture. So all three projects have uh, developed a, a data agreement, which is based uh, from the standards. Uh, originally it worked with, uh, started with Cantera. They've created a schema and Work has progressed and adopted from ISO. There is work in 27560. It's currently in working draft. And what we're doing is a, a, a preview of what will be coming, but as well as work that has been in, done in Cantera. So what is a data agreement? It's an immutable record of consent for processing of uh, personal information. Uh, what we've done is uh, tying to SSI or DLT is that when you're exchanging information, you're creating a record of that exchange. So similar to going to a store, you buy a purchase a product and you're using a, you're getting a receipt. Here, when you do it, use a digital service, you're actually getting a receipt of the, what are they providing? What service and purpose? And what this does, it allows for an individual to be able to control more closely how they want to restrict how they want to share their data. Possibly they don't want to go outside of their jurisdiction or possibly they don't want their data to be stored outside of their location. And I'm gonna go briefly through the, what is this data agreement? So just describing some key points there is a, a purpose in this record, which can, indicates, for example, this is for purpose of health test verification. You may indicate the storage location and duration that you're gonna keep that information, as well as you're indicating the jurisdiction. And you'll see also there is a indication of the lawful basis. Uh, we can indicate consent and all the other uh, lawful basis for processing data. We also see a potential going forward as the EU is setting up a GDPR certification that this uh, receipt can also indicate there has been a, a certification performed and you can refer to it as well as performance of an assessment. So understanding the risks of sharing the data you can easily make a highlight and say, okay, these are the risks that have been identified and you can share it with the individual if they shall so choose. And also we're handling the personal data. We'll list of all the personal data and if they're flagged for uh, sensitivity. We'll also indicate what are the third parties that might be involved with sharing further down uh, after the data controller. And also we're getting a sign off. And this is where we're signing a presentation of a notice and signing possibly a consent. So once you agree with sharing the data, uh, then you get that uh, a immutable record of a consent where the data subject has signed. And also further down the road, we can see the potential of adding, how do you invoke your privacy rights? For example, if I want to withdraw, erase, or, or, or access my data, how do I perform that? You might have a, a link to that information. 
So this is an introduction of the data agreement. I'm going to now go into the three demos. First, we're going to get the privacy uh, iGrant I.O. together with the privacy ant. And we're going to demonstrate in this the, how DPIA is assisting in creating uh, the data agreement. Then after iGrant privacy ant, we'll have Getica. And then at the end, we're going to have human colossus. And the, uh, at the end, we're going to do a, a, a next step. And after we're done, then we can open up for questions in Q&A. So I'm going to hand over to Lau if you want to continue. Thank you, Jan. Okay. So to give you a little bit of a background to what uh, this whole project is about, this project is called Autom Automated Data Agreements, where we developed the concept of data agreement as part of an NGI, it's the FLAB initiative. Uh, as uh, Jan pointed out, a data agreement is to record the conditions for an organization to process personal data in accordance with regulations such as the GDPR. Uh, we have produced a bunch of uh, 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 artifacts as part of this uh, project that includes a, a working solution, uh, including the specifications around data agreement, um, proposing a, a, a DID method uh, called DID by data, as well as implementing a data agreement using DID com protocol. Uh, we, as part of the project, we also uh, is, the, and it is a work in progress where we are extending the concept of data agreement towards delegated consent and agreement power. Next page, Jan. So, for any data agreement to be created and, and to have the receipt, as Jan pointed out, it undergoes a number of steps. The very top part, uh, Jan, if you could click, click the slide. The very top part is where the, uh, the four different phases uh, that are typical in a data agreement lifecycle is depicted, starting with definition, preparation, capture, and proof. Uh, the definition and preparation is uh, pretty much uh, the, the role that performs it is the organization itself, while the capture is towards the individual, and the proof can be anybody, including an independent third party auditor. Yeah. Okay. I think, uh, do you want to take away from here, Yeah. Uh, yeah, I can describe the, the first two steps. So from a definition, we're going to be looking at the, the privacy act, where uh, very shortly, where we're going to demonstrate how we're creating a definition of the content of a data agreement. And, and from there, we're going to be able to help with the preparation that would be helping with the automation of creating the data agreement that shall be registered with uh, when you're applying the DID method to signing between the a controller and a data subject. Do you want to take here or shall I keep going? Yeah. Then we have the capture where the individual uh, is presented with the data given uh, and the individual signs off or rejects or, or different, different um, options are provided. And finally, the last one is the proof where uh, any independent auditor or anybody else can verify the authenticity of the data agreement itself. So this is to show a very quick overview of the, uh, the component architecture. It typically follows any microservice architecture. Uh, as you can see, there are certain components that are like the core components, and then there are certain things which are very much pluggable. So we are not really tied to any uh, particular implementation in, in a way. Uh, it is very much extensible, all the code base that we have, you know, and the concepts are very much reusable uh, in any system. It doesn't need to be typically be a did base uh, system in a way. Next slide. Yeah, these are, the, these are just for the documentation for your uh, information. So we have, a, we have prepared, we have produced a bunch of uh, artifacts, uh, including the APIs and specifications. Um, then we have uh, published a white paper on the whole idea of a sustainable data exchange with data agreements. We'll be soon publishing another uh, white paper which is about, about extending data agreements for delegation. And we have on the right side, we have a bunch of um, uh, source code that are all Apache 2.0 licensed. 
uh, and the commercial implementations essentially in privacy and which is the DPA tool which Jan will be demonstrating. And of course in iGrant, uh, both in our verification services that is iGrant Enterprise Dashboard, as well as in, in our data wallet, uh, we, we have it functional today. Over to you, Jan. Okay, so now it's uh, demo time. So I'm gonna give an introduction to the tool uh, from Privacyant. It's an online tool where you can uh, apply your privacy program within a company. That means you can look at all your privacy and security compliance and 27,000 series compliance, and you can add the controls and perform your risk assessment through this tool. So what I'm gonna start is by demonstrating that we created a project. The demo will be looking at a, a travel agent uh, for an airline, which will get the data from a iGrant IO wallet. And the information will be coming from a test center that has collected data and has, uh, you have previously shared it to this wallet through another interaction, another uh, purpose. We're focusing on one purpose is the communication with the travel agent. You can see through the tool, what are the data points that are being shared? There'll be a beneficiary name, vaccination dosage and vaccination data. And you'll see there's a classification of uh, a category. We're also trying to use the W3C DPV for this vocabulary. So it's standardized. So all of the implementations you'll see together today will try to be following those. And the advantage of having these tools, you can easily track where is the storage information. In this case, uh, it's indicated as Sweden. You can also be monitoring how is the transfer um, let's say across EU or other countries, are there trans-border agreements? This gives you from a company a, an overview of how the information might be um, transferred. Plus you have the, in a privacy program, you're looking at what activities need to be in place and the progress to mitigate any of the risks that are being identified. But the purpose of this demo is not to show this part, but how do we create these data uh, agreements. So if I go into a uh, the purpose, here I'm going to be assigning a this diff demo receive receiving of credentials, where we give a, a description for verifying individuals COVID test. The industry group or service is a healthcare. We're seeing that legal basis or lawful basis of processing is based on consent. The retention time is seven days. And who, who is the contact uh, for that information? And you can see through the inventory, what is the data that's being used? And when we have set all this information, we're able to export. For demonstration purpose, we're showing here integration with the iGrant side is done through an API. And here you'll see that information in the schema that I originally started describing, where you have who is their controller, uh, the jurisdiction, policy, retention period, are there any ge geographic restrictions, purpose, and your three purposes. And here you can see the categories and the sensitivity. And that's the information that's then ready for Lau to demonstrate on how iGrant then is collecting this information. I'm gonna start presenting so that you can take over. Oh yeah. <clears throat> okay, are you ready? Yeah, absolutely. Pretty good. So I, I hope you can see my screen, right? Yep. Yeah, so essentially the, on my right side of the screen is, is the iGrant Enterprise Dashboard which is a verification configurator tooling. And then on the left side is the data wallet uh, again from iGrant. So uh, of course, you know, what I'm going to do is to really fetch the, con the data agreement that has been generated. For sake of simplicity, we just uh, you know, use the import function. And I've already um, copied up the JSON that uh, Jan, Jan has actually exported basically. And I'm able to uh, immediately once exported, I I'm able to actually 
save it. Let me mark it as 2.0. And I'm able to save it in, as a new data agreement. And what happens in the background is essentially this data agreement is getting converted into, so this, this diff demo receiving credentials converted into uh, a verification service. Um, in this case, it's a, it's a verifier or a data using service that actually, uh, in, in this case, it's the travel, travel company's uh, data using service. So if I go to the uh, self-sovereign identity verifications, I should be able to see a uh, corresponding entry soon. Hopefully soon. Let me see. Yeah, I can see this diff demo receive cover credentials, one one dot two dot zero, and then I'm able to actually you know generate a QR code um, that represents uh, or that, that is used to collect a bunch of information from uh, an individual. So in this case, what I'm going to do is to really scan this QR code. So on the left side, I have my mobile phone, which uh, for the sake of simplicity, I already have my COVID certificates, uh, which, is, which is pretty much what the data this QR code is uh, requesting or the data that the airline company is requesting. So I, I click the share data and scan the QR code that is presented to me by the airline company and the data agreement is appearing. So let me unhide this privacy button on the very top. Right. So you can see that there are, uh, you know, I, I have two data agreements that are present in the in my wallet. So I have an option to really choose uh, which one of those. So because obviously I choose the the um, the latest uh, my second dosage uh, vaccination proof, and all the data agreement policies also uh, can easily be seen. Uh, and these are these are the bunch of things that um, that is configured uh, by by the privacy and DPAA tooling process, basically. So once I confirm to the data agreement, uh, I'm basically signing the agreement in practice uh, and the data get trans, trans uh, data get exchanged to the travel company. So if I get, now go to the, to, the, to the data history, I should be able to see a verification studio over here that of course provides me with information about information uh, the travel company get the information about my uh, COVID vaccination details. That's this is uh, and th that's actually using COVID data. This is an actual. Swedish, this is a real data. Yes, that's right. The COVID certificate that was scanned in uh, and stored on the wallet as to do the verification. So back well, to you. Yeah. Great. Um, it's uh, up to Gataka now. Uh, do you are you ready to uh, share a screen? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> Let me. Okay. Wait. Oh, just a second. Oh, I have to restart Chrome. Just a second. No sweat. Shall I run some background music now while we wait in suspense for the next demo? Uh, Jose, do you want maybe more time and then Paul goes first? The sound of yeah, snowflakes. I'm, I'm not sure about Jose's problem, but if it takes more than, than 30 seconds, I would suggest to switch to Paul. Okay, we'll do. And while we wait, Juan, your icon, is it actually a pet of yours or you just found it on the internet? It's yeah, it's just a meme. I don't even remember where I found it. I think it was an advertisement actually. <laughs> I might get an NFT for it. Or, 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 <laughs> yeah, I own yeah. this. The, 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 big, uh, the big, big Lebowski animal. Yeah. Nice, mar <laughs> nice, nice marmot, man. Yeah. <laughs> so Jose, are you ready or shall we move? Uh, or you need more time, so Paul can, can take you jump it. Can one because I just had to close Chrome, so everything I had prepared for the demo 
just post. okay so let's let's go for paul paul are you ready to to go through paul sorry mute yes i'm good to go yeah awesome. i'll share this yeah all right so hopefully you can all see my screen yep great Cool. So, um, so this is a, a really about the resolution of, of the data agreement forms. Uh, so, multi-language data agreement forms using OCA. Uh, it's an interoperable data capture solution for for these agreements. Um, actually, bear with me. I'm just gonna have to get rid of all of your lovely faces because you're in the way of my thing. Uh, so yeah, OCA for um, Overlays Capture Architecture. Many of you on the call will already know this architecture. Um, um, so I won't go into it in much, much detail. All I'll say here is that it, OCA presents a schema as a multi-dimensional object consisting of a stable schema uh, capture base. Sorry, we just changed the name recently from schema base to capture base and interoperable overlays. Um, so you can, so basically every, any task that happens within a schema, uh, it, any different task is held with its, with its own unique uh, overlay. And then that's cryptographically linked to the capture base. So overlays are task oriented linked data objects that provide additional coloration to the capture base. Um, so in this demo um, that I'm going to show you, you'll see a data agreement there on, on the left, um, and I'll show you the proper uh, resolved version of that in a minute. But basically, for multi-language, there's a few overlays that are basically uh, um, coming into the stack and, and changing the language. So the first one's a meta overlay. So a meta overlay is a core linked object that defines contextual metadata about the schema, including the schema name and the description and broad classification schemes. So uh, initially, we had this in the capture base. But then when we were changing language, it wasn't resolving. So this, this allows you to change the form name in, into any language. Um, there's an entry overlay. So you'll see there on the left, uh, the scroll down there has predefined entries. Again, that can be done in multiple languages. An entry overlay is a core linked object that defines predefined field values in a specified language. It's good practice to avoid implementing freeform text fields to minimize the risk of capturing unforeseen uh, PII and QII information or sensitive information. So this overlay type enables structured data to be entered, thereby negating the risk of capturing and storing and subsequently storing dangerous data. Uh, a label overlay, um, again, uh, so, so the label overlay um, is for uh, category labels and also attribute labels. Um, so a, a label overlay is a core linked object that defines attribute and category labels for a specific locale. Uh, this overlay type enables all labels to be displayed in a preferred language at the presentation layer for better comprehensibility to the end user. And finally, is an information overlay. So um, this is really defines instructional or informational or legal pros to assist the data entry process. So, you know, on your mobile phone, when you have to enter in information, you have like the eye icon. That eye icon is like the information for uh, giving you data entry hints. So those are the overlays that you'll see. Um, so one of the ones that I want to pull out here is the entry overlay, because the, the entry overlay, you can actually point to different objects. So in this case, I've kind of uh, put, put an image here of, say, you have five attributes. Attribute one can be pointing to uh, an external code table. Uh, you can think of a code table as a, also known as a lookup table. So it's basically a simple array that uh, replaces runtime computation with a simpler array indexing uh, operation. The savings in processing time can significantly um, can be significant because retrieving a value from memory is often faster than carrying out an expensive computation or input output operation. An OCA table is a lookup table that OCA can ingest. So I'll show you a little bit about that during the demo. Um, and finally, this is what's happening. So with the data agreements, um, I'll la leave you to read what they are on the left because uh, I think uh, Jan and Lyle did a good job of explaining that. But basically, any of the language overlays can basically be swapped out and, and back into the stack. So that's how it changes the language. So I'm going to show you in the demo. Uh, we currently have English, uh, Dutch, Swedish, and Chinese. So I'll show you that during the demo. Um, 
so there's a few pieces that I, I have to bring up. One's an OCA data capture specification, which is an Excel uh, file, which is in a specific structure that you can put it into our parser and it automatically generates all of the, uh, the capture base and the overlays into, into JSON files. Um, the same thing for the code tables, those external code tables. So you can kind of think of maybe a, a table of uh, countries. You can have the countries in English or in our case, Dutch, Swedish or Chinese. Uh, it'll point uh, to a code table. Again, that, that's, that Excel spreadsheet can be passed and JSON files created. Um, the OCA data store is where we're at the moment storing all of the, the code table JSON files and the OCA repository is where we're storing all of the schema bases and the overlays in JSON files. And then obviously I can show you the, the, the multi-language uh, data agreement form. So what, let, me, so let me stop sharing here and then I will quickly Oops, uh, I, I will bring up my desktop. Uh, okay, so share desktop. Hopefully you can see my desktop now. So, um, so what you're seeing in front of you, this is the OCA data capture specification. And in here, um, our parser will ignore the readme file. That's, that's uh, purely so that you can kind of uh, add some information so people know what this uh, spreadsheet's about. So we can start with the main um, tab here. In the, in the main tab, at the top, you'll see sort of the third line there. You, when it starts with CB, that basically means it's in, held in the capture base, in the base object. And where it's OL, that's an overlay. So in this case, you, 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 you can name all of your, your attribute names. Um, OCA doesn't care what you name, name this. This is an architecture, it's not an ontology. So you can, you can name the things what, uh, as you wish. Uh, an attribute type, uh, so um, you add your attribute type there. Um, this flagged attribute is where you flag any uh, PII information. And then you've got uh, the rest of the ones here are overlays. So uh, a character set encoding overlay, it's defaulted as UTF-8. But if, uh, if you had a, a strange character encoding for uh, you know, ancient Hebrew or whatever, um, you, could, you could put a different character encoding set there. Um, the format overlay, so kind of fairly typical. If you have an ISO standard that you're following, you can put it in here, or if it's a, uh, you know, any uh, date formatting, you can, you can add it in here. It's just so that people know what to expect uh, as the format. Entry codes, uh, so there's two kind of uh, entry overlays. One's an entry codes overlay and one's an entry overlay. And the entry codes overlay is really the machine readable stuff. And, uh, and the entry overlay is for human readable stuff. And within here, I will show you some of these things. So uh, you this is where you can point to an external uh, table. So if I take this, um, this SAI here for uh, included region, uh, and I pop it into, um, let me pop it into here. Uh, da, da, da. I think it's this one. Yeah, okay, so I'll uh, pop it into the data vault here. here. Great, and so I hit get here. Hopefully this will work. Get, I have to click try it out, which is a bit weird. I don't know why you have to do that. Should just be automatic. Um, and then it's, ooh, hang on, uh, is it not? For some reason, it does this sometimes when you share your screen, it's not allowing me to put into that. Anyway, it's uh, it does work. I think this is a Zoom. Out. Sorry? Click try oh. out, then you can enter. Ah, thank you. <laughs> thank you, you can see my, my tech genius coming in. Uh, great, thanks, Christoph. Good to have you on the call. <laughs> uh, and I hit execute, and then um, good. And then here you've got a download file. So if I click that download file, uh, it then goes into my downloads folder. I can uh, open that up. And you get this kind of crazy thing, which I can make a little bit more friendly than that by going in here and popping it in, hopefully. Gosh, it's really slow. Ah. Uh, maybe I'll maybe I'll have to stick at this. Um, hey, Paul, just yeah. to keep the demo yeah. times, you have two more yeah. minutes. 
Okay, cool. Yeah, so anyway, you parse the stuff. You can do all that through here. I'll quickly whiz through the rest of this. You've got, uh, this is where you do all your English language stuff. Um, you've got your uh, Dutch, Swedish, and Chinese. And uh, and then we'll, we'll pull it into the form. So uh, the other thing I did want to show you was quickly my God, this is super slow, is this code table. Uh, it's the same thing. It's got a readme file, which, uh, which the uh, machines don't care about. And then you've got, you've got all of the, uh, the, the languages held here uh, in the different tabs. It's, um, it's really slow on my side, so I'm not gonna fiddle around with that too much. Um, but what you, you guys will be interested in will probably be the, uh, the OCA editor. So if I go to the OCA editor, and I click uh, pick pick up a zip file, and go to should be here a zip file. Uh, yeah, it's right there. The zip file and click upload. Uh, the form will automatically resolve from all of the, all of that input. And, uh, Sorry, it's quite a lot of information. So here you go, there you've got your data agreement. Um, and in here, uh, whenever you, so all of these predefined entries here, these are pulling from a, from a code table, from a lookup table. So if I kind of change uh, language here to Chinese, the whole form will change to Chinese and all of the, the countries will change to Chinese as well. Um, and uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. I mean. The content within here, where uh, Jan and I are working really closely together to make sure that we're aligned on all of this stuff, um, all of the predefined entries, etc. Um, and uh, we're using, as as Jan said, we're using the the DPV for things like purpose, so that this uh, this is all coming from a DPV uh, lookup table. So that that's pretty much it from my end. Um, if you have any questions, uh, etc., um, you can email me directly, um, and. Uh, if yeah. Uh, one comment before we go to, to Jose, one thing that mm -hmm. I think is brilliant with what you have done is the vocabulary. Uh, when we're implementing the data agreement and getting the same language, uh, multiple language support, it's it's a very a good example for us to all follow. So yeah, thanks, Paul. Perfect. Over to you, Jose. All good now? Awesome. Yeah, can you hear me right? Yep. Hear yeah, you. Everything should be good now. Let's hope so. Okay. Uh, are you seeing my screen? Yes. Okay. So, well, first of all, hello, everyone. Uh, I am Jose. I work at Gadaka. And we are also uh, making an effort towards the finding a standard for data agreements. Uh, uh, we are pushing Gataka the VUI initiative and the data agreements will be, it is one of the three main working packages we're working on. So I will try to make a demonstration first of our current uh, state of the uh, state of implementation which is where we come from in Gataga, the verifiable consents, and this can show what we try to achieve with the data agreements and, and then how, how one document will evolve into the other and how everything fits into the VUI and the standards that verifiers and wallets uh, need to follow. So what we use at Gataga uh, until now were verifiable consents which is a, uh, an independent document and it's a verifiable document following the uh, like verifiable credentials, verifiable presentations, which are following the link data proof standard. And they're independent from the presentation, but they represent a service or the data shared between a user and a service provider in order to obtain a, a certain digital service. So those if you can see here the comparison, uh, when on a current application, uh, whenever a presentation is exchanged, it could be that a consent also needs to be exchanged using a parallel but different uh, protocol. So those consents 
don't contain actually the, the claim values. They contain reference to the information, specific reference to the information that has been shared. So it can be known and, and follow the, the life cycle of that information. And then I will also, well, uh, we also use them to enable the usage of pairwise DADs uh, in order to, uh, to sign the presentations. I don't want to extend a little bit on this because it's uh, very Gataka specific, but uh, what we, it's something we do in order to make a, a technical enforcement of the consent and the usage of the credentials is to use a specific DID, a pairwise DID only for that relation. Uh, and we use that to sign the presentations and to make all the communication between the user and the verifier. And the consent is used, uh, is the only proof of relation uh, between the subject DAD, which is present on all the credentials, and the uh, holders DAD, which is the one, uh, the pairwise relation signing that presentation. So without a valid consent, a verifier could not be able to trust a presentation because he cannot state the relation between the holder signing the presentation and the subject of the credentials present. And so I will go a little bit deeper into the life cycle on how we use the consent, uh, knowing that the consent needs only to be shared uh, upon the creation of the first relation between the user and the verifier and with the modifications or the end of the relation with the revocation of the, the consent. So uh, that means that uh, it should always reflect the current status and the current data shared between the user and the verifier. So the verifier could modify it by asking a different set of credentials, maybe less, maybe more, or maybe modifying the purpose for which he's using those credentials. And on the other side, the user could be wanting to replace pieces of specific data shared, but hold by the verifier in the service, or revoke access to some credentials if those credentials were not needed in, in, to provide service, but were just optional uh, some cases. And both could at any time end the relation and uh, demand the revocation of the consent. So you can see a little bit the, the life cycle of the consent. And how does this map in, into the data agreement? Well, as you have seen, uh, first you have uh, on the link side of the uh, left side of the screen, you have the verifiable consent as we use it in Gattaca, a simplified version because it wouldn't fit the whole document, the, the screen. And on the right side, you have a schema of the data agreement as wanted to, to be proposed on, on the current working package on the GUI. So it has a, a improvements. You, you all keep the metadata about the, the data agreement ID, about the uh, verifier and the subject involved. You have a lot of information with all the interesting and, and advantage uh, shown by Jan before uh, about the relation with DPIAs and which could easily to enforce uh, GDPI constraints and, and so on. You can even, uh, you have a lot of, a lot more of uh, legal basis and, and, and the policies are stated uh, inside of the, the same document. The personal data is still reflects and linked to the purpose in the, just like it was before. And you have a little more traceability uh, by using the events and, and knowing which party has performed which operation along the life cycle of the consent of the data agreement. So this data agreement would fall, uh, in, as we have explained, uh, 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 it's a different protocol, but it's really tied to the presentation exchange protocol or to whatever presentation exchange we're using. Uh, that's why we are trying to push it on the on the GUI. The GUI, uh, uh, as we know, it's, uh, it's the Verifier Universal Interface. It's a group of working packages trying to easy the and, and to allow any wallet to any, of any provider to share uh, and exchange information, verifiable credentials with any verifier, even if it's on a different tech stack, just by offering uh, common standards or APIs 
that could allow to enter different governance frameworks or from other uh, tech providers. And uh, one of them, so all those, uh, we also try to coordinate the efforts so that, for instance, if the data agreement is very tied to the exchange and the conditions of a, of a presentation definition, uh, then uh, it could be re um, stated and really so on. And it's something we are pushing to move also into, into DIF. And I will try to do a little demo, which is, it can be very fast and simple, but are you seeing my screen right? Yep. Okay, so I, as a user, will try to, this is the common demo we used to show. I will try to apply for an online cybersecurity master in this university, which uh, has SSI services uh, and you can use, can work as a verifier. Uh, so the configuration of this verifier uh, allow to make a specific presentation request, a presentation definition and what kind of credentials and if they're mandatory or not uh, can be requested to the user. And inside the same presentation definition, we had embedded the request, the purposes for the verifiable consent. So you, for instance, the, I don't know, the birth date may be used for authentication or for uh, regulation and so on. Those purposes will change uh, and, and align again uh, on the data agreement standard, but those are the, the previews existing on the Kataka verifiable consent. And on the wallet side, when the user scans the QR and gets requested the credentials, okay, he will see under each credential for which purpose or for which purposes, in if it's plural, uh, because it could be different, uh, uh, that credential is required. Uh, I think it's not very clear on the screen, but yeah, for instance, the document number is used for regulation and the gender is just for application purposes or the academic institution also for, for regulation and so on. And yeah, once the user consent, oops, I need to accept all the credentials. Okay, yeah, I will use my name. Uh -huh. Yeah, I don't. Oh, okay, I don't have all the the valid credentials, so I can't consent and I cannot share the the service. But if I did, then the consent document will be stored in both the wallet and the verifier, and I will always be. Uh, let's see if it's used on any services. I could always know from the credential in which to which data and which services I have provided access to that credential. Yeah. And that's everything on our side. I, should I give you back the presentation, Jan? Uh, well, if you have see. any questions, of course, just feel free to ask or send an email. What, what I thought, yeah, we can go through the, the last slide and then we can uh, open up for questions. Uh, thanks, Jose. I think what you've done in, in the connection between the proof and the consent with the attribute ID makes it very clear what is the, the data agreement surrounding the credential information. Uh, so what I presume you can see my, my screen here. Uh, what's interesting presenting to DIFF is for you to see what we see as new next steps from the NGI ESIF project. And uh, there, are, I've counted five different aspects that need to be looked at. One is looking at the legal and human experience, the guidelines and requirements. We've been somewhat technical in the, in the work we've done, but the, there might be guidelines needed in order to, how do you present this information so that uh, across implementations that they, they're, uh, keeping a, a common uh, way of presenting information. The second point is the work we have been doing uh, a lot in our, our, in our last six months is looking at the data model, the life cycle, what the schema should look like and agreeing with the common vocabulary. And that's a work that will continue. Uh, I know that Cantaro has been work, doing work there as well. So we may be communicating with them. And then comes where could be of interest to DIFF, which is uh, how do we perform the interworking uh, over DLT? 
and the proof request and what mechanisms are, are being used uh, if it, there's a did method uh, for setting up the interworking between two imp uh, implementers and uh, establishing we can demonstrate that yes we can do a interoperability test and also looking at possibly or uh, having a common API definition and this is where I end the 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 demo part and, and presentation and I'd like to open up the floor for any questions that people may have or comments we might spend more time talking within with diff to to see if the uh, credentials and claims uh, working group is interested in, in uh, working in this area. So I open up the floor for any questions. And thank you for listening in to our, our demo. I did see some comments were being made under the, the chat. And I see there is a hand from Daniel. Sorry, there was an applause for the well presented. Oh, it's applause. Thank you. <laughs> or thanks to the whole group. We did have a little lick up here and there, but you know, it's the first time. So <laughs> I think we, we did good. Yeah. There was a comment. I don't know if you saw that. Uh, what's the usage of, of what the OCA has done? And uh, Lau, you might want to comment on it as to what is the the work that could be done into uh, integration between OCA work and iGrant. I don't know if Jose wants to comment from Gataka, but you can start. Well, uh, you're muted, so we can't hear you. Famous problem. There you go. <laughs> so yeah, one fundamental reason why we are in a token data agreement is 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 to ensure that any kind of data exchange or sharing uh, is adhering to the law. And when I talk about law, uh, jurisdiction and the language ability and being able to actually configure in different languages, et cetera, is, is, is of immense value. And that's, that's precisely what we are. We're looking at OZA4. Uh, then David, David Chadwick also asked about, uh, is there any mobile wallet implementation? Uh, what? I think, I think we hear your keyboard. If... Sorry. <laughs> so when it comes to the mobile wallet side, the, the advantage is that and most of the, at least the iOS and Android uh, provide some certain features. What is most important is actually the content uh, per se. And, and if the content actually is, uh, is supporting the language, which is what the OCA does, uh, showing it in a mobile is, is extremely straightforward in my mind. Uh, because because the metadata within the mobile is uh, iOS and Android supports natively all this kind of lang language translation. So the content is where the you know, major trick, trick, tricky part is, and that is what OCF solves us for it. So we don't necessarily have to really support uh, OCF for mobile wallet per se, uh, as long as we actually make it configurable and support in the say, configuration or the, the definition progression phase, it's, it's good enough uh, to begin. Thanks, Lau. Jose, did you want to do any reflection on the? Uh, I mean, you don't I have just, to. Just... Yeah, I, I don't have too much comment. We don't support OCA yet, and we we are maybe looking forward adopting it. Uh, but I, I agree that's a common problem with every <coughs> wallet or implementer. Oh, thanks. Yeah, and I can give a bit of a, um, a, a what the, the, what's happening with OCA as well, which might might be useful for people. Um, is that the first thing to note is that everything within OCA is deterministic. So you know that's the capture base and all of the overlays, um, and that's super important because the the one thing obviously with JSON LD is it's heavily steeped in URLs, and within the the linking process of JSON LD you have this problem with uh, creating forms because you can authenticate the form, but then, you know, a URL, uh, which is kind of um, underpinning the underlying schema can change uh, the con sorry, the content behind that URL can change, even though you've authenticated the credential. So it uh, so 
that suddenly brings a security risk uh, with the uh, with with the actual um, object. So that's that's why we're that's why we're really pushing OCA is because it it defeat it, it gets rid of that problem because everything is absolutely deterministic. Um, it, it doesn't rely on kind of external URLs and stuff like that. But uh, mm -hmm. I thought that might be interesting for you guys. Right. Cool. Thanks, Paul. So Juan, what do you think? Shall we uh, end the call or like the formal recording, and then we, uh, if there are no more questions, big if though, we can, uh, give, then, give, then... give it another minute for questions. Come on, other people. Okay, might okay, it. okay. Twist their arm a little. Come on, people. <laughs> well, maybe so, if we go so... not recorded, then it's maybe they speak. You know. <laughs> Let me let me make a comment. This is my first time attending this meeting. I, I work for ident I work for identity.com. My name is William. And uh, yeah, it's it's amazing to experience what the rest of the world sees outside of the world I've been working in for a while now. Uh, this is incredible. Like you guys have opened my mind up in ways I, I don't even know. I've got like two, three pages of writing that I took down in this meeting. I really appreciate the efforts that you guys are doing. And uh, yeah, I just want to say thank you. This has been very, very cool. Awesome. You're welcome to participate uh, with further discussions. I mean, you're always welcome. Yeah, I, I'm, uh, you guys are stuck with me now. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you based, by the way? I'm in Cape Town, South Africa. South Africa, oh. Yeah, yeah. but yeah, this is incredible. Like this venture identity has been something I've been obsessed about for since I've discovered blockchain, every blockchain project I tried to do fell apart because of lack of identity on chain. And um, yeah, the, and yeah, this this was a very very cool first time experience working with you or hearing what you guys are doing. Yeah, and what we're trying to do is add the provenance surrounding the data exchange. You can't treat them separately. Verifiable credentials is awesome. I mean, I can prove, oh, here's my identity. I have, I don't have COVID and so forth, but you don't know how the business is gonna use that information. That's why that little receipt being able to say, oh, this is how you're using my information is key in my, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And that's my standardization work and ISO. I'm the co-editor of 27.560 is the regulators that are looking at Let's make it official. Let's let's have that. You need to support these records. So there are discussions uh, both in ISO regulators and within Europe of of maybe requiring these these records or these data agreements. So yeah, I look forward. To, I look forward to spending more time with you guys. Okay, great. Thanks. Was that enough twisting, John? <laughs> I did want to ask Jose actually. Oh, sorry, Martin has a question, maybe. Uh, that's uh, yeah. Um, go ahead. yeah, hi, Martin, also from Identia.com. Um, from the presentation point of view, what I've seen in the iGrant demo around sharing a credential and in the Gattaca demo was very similar from the use case that was shown, but I didn't understand the technical differentiation. So especially, uh, um, are you using the same kind of mechanism I grant, like a PE or VUI, or uh, what are the similarities in the credential and data agreement exchange protocol? Okay, I may, I may answer this. Uh, right now, we have worked towards uh, sharing a common data model. Uh, the presentation exchange protocol from iGrant and from Gadaga are not the same. So we are uh, we have different opinions or, or uh, experience in order to to make it in, into a specific uh, exchange protocol. I think iGrantio is using uh, Hyperlayer Iris. Uh, and did come for, for the standards and, and protocols for, for exchange of credentials. While in Gataka, we had first our proprietary uh, exchange protocol, well, our, at least our own implementation. And now we're trying to implement the DIF presentation exchange over the ID side of version two. And the, so what we are trying to see also in the standards is to know how to fit that presentation definition or inside the presentation definition or inside 
or maybe along the the presentation exchange. And that's only Gadaga's point of view. I'm, I'm I don't want to talk about over I grant yours here, but yeah. Uh, how to to include the data agreement and the different processes and status and and errors caused by the data agreement inside uh, or together with the, the exchange protocol with in our case with the the SIOP and the diff presentation exchange if could if, i make if, a comment on that um, oh sure babe. go ahead i think that's really interesting what you said jose because um I'm, I'm working in the uh, a bit with the diff presentation exchange people and also in, inside the OIDC group for transferring the diff P in the protocol. Oh, sorry, Mitch. And, um, and basically, the, the point I'm making is that the, the, the actual specification of the, of the policy, which is diff P and, and your privacy stuff should be flexible and, and shouldn't be sort of hard coded in because we don't know what new requirements other people will have. You've just brought a new requirement along, which is privacy protection, basically, and, and adding that into uh, requesting verifiable credentials. And I don't believe we can expect everybody to agree on one standard for everything. But different groups will have their own way of specifying different things and therefore the the protocol like didcom or oidc should allow people to put their own policies in there so they can actually add the extra feature they want so you would be able to add your privacy protection along with diff p if oidc allowed it mm. you, well, i don't well, know what you think about I, that I, if I can comment on that, uh, yeah. if you saw one of the activities is a data model and life cycle, which is somewhat independent of the underlying technology, then it's the, mm -hmm. the stack that you would implement. So the activity would be done at two levels. Exactly. And, I think, That's, and yeah. what I think could be good with diff is that uh, there is an activity defining the, that stack part. There might yeah. be two implementations, but there is a, a concerted mm -hmm. effort to define and, and see that the same functionality. We might in the future even look at interoperability between the stacks. I mean, just like interledger uh, support. But uh, I agree that we shouldn't be only on one uh, ledger. Yeah, I, I, I agree. But and I think in that layering as well, the, the management layer of specifying verifiable credentials of what you require in the policy, that goes above the protocol layer. So the protocol mm -hmm. layer which could be DIDCOM or, or OIDC is the, layer, is the layer in which you carry the requirements, but the layer above the management layer is where you specify the requirements to be carried in the protocol layer. Right. Yeah. And but if you actually I, hard bake the two layers together, you, you're, you're making the thing too inflexible, yeah. too brittle. Yeah. And I think we've done a pretty good job with all the projects as to create a base schema of how mm. we interpret we need to iron out some more details, but there's an effort. Plus, we have a standard that we can refer to, if that's yeah. Contara or ISO. Yeah. So I don't know if uh, so the others want to comment on that. Yeah, I was going to say to um, David also that with with OCA, because you can get your your entries can be can be um, piped to an external table. So, for instance, something like um, you know. Um, region or something at the moment we're using gix as our main uh no, not region uh sorry industry industry sector we're using gix codes but if you wanted to uh, you know build a, a lookup table for uh for any of the other ones sick or whatever like you could definitely do that we're, we're not you know certainly with oca we're not forcing people to use those things so oca has the flexibility to be you, you to be able to kind of chop uh, you know chop things into the stack as you wish mm -hmm. but i think we, we probably but we've with the data agreement i think we do need to uh, come up with like a a, a core um, capture base. Um, everything else is, is is up for grabs, but I think the capture base needs to be stable. Yeah. Uh, Lal, did you want to say something? Yeah, no, I just wanted to answer back uh, to Martin, uh, who asked the question, what stack are we on? So we are uh, essentially, we are uh, built on top of, you know, whatever chat you have put in is exactly what we have. The Aries uh, protocol with did come. Uh, and what we did is we used the uh, decorator protocol to add 
uh, the data agreement uh, during impersonation exchange. So I mean, I, the data I agreement would... is self -defined. I would now be interested who had the easier experience of bringing the data agreement parts <laughs> into an existing protocol. <laughs> yeah, so, so, so we'll, if, you, we'll if, you're, if you're actually on an existing protocol, what we also did is that we, we added a plugin. So mm -hmm. you can, if you have like Aries, you can just install, you know, when you're in, starting the Aries uh, uh, instance, you actually just add this protocol, uh, add this plugin in. And it automatically takes everything on board, and the whole so it's it's completely hidden uh, from an implementation point of view. So if you're a developer of it, you just get it free basically. Yeah, cool. So that's that's how it uh, it works today. And I and I think uh, I would also say that figuring out how these kinds of um, consent receipts, GDPR receipts, all of these sorts of policy. I, I think David's right to call them sort of policy um, metadata that needs to sort of be negotiated along with any presentation exchange or issuance flow. Right. Um, I think we need to figure out how to get that into presentation exchange in a way that works across everything. Like uh, the fact that like wacky PEX is good. Like when, it, mm -hmm. when, if someone's using, you know, the, the latest final, <laughs> when Didcom V2 is definitively 2.0, um, that will sort of cement how you get the presentation objects back and forth. But I'm with David that we have to make sure it's right. flexible enough that it works exactly. across all these use cases across multiple protocols. Cause we already have here, running code prototypes, you know, in some cases, production implementations, exchanging yeah. presentation exchange objects. And if we can't make it work with presentation exchange, we need to speak up soon before presentation V2 gets finalized and say, you know, this needs to be optional. This needs to be extensible. Like we need the extension points hammered out with all of these sort of inputs. Yeah, I agree, yeah, Juan. That's why in fact, we're I mean, that one of the main goals in, in WE and in fact is try to coordinate these efforts and the, and if we detect some working package or some part of the resolution or the verification on, on the credentials, that's not clearly implemented or easily to do mm. outside your tech stack. We're trying to, to find this and, and help the, the interaction and the, the influence in, in the other work in, yeah, in the other standard. Absolutely. What we could do is uh, we can discuss one about setting up a, a, what a, a project to do this effort. And then we could set some milestones of the effort to, to figure out uh, initially the use cases and the flexibility that we need to have. And then we can review then the, the presentation proof and, and so that we know what requirements might be influencing what, what might change so that we don't go too directly on the implementation without understanding, okay, these are the requirements. Yeah, we... yeah, yeah, yeah. Documenting that would be immensely, <laughs> uh, it would make very objective the request to presentation exchange. We, we yeah. could, if, if you can't point to the whole thing, use case requirement, uh, yeah. exact yeah. line of the protocol that, <laughs> yeah. There will be probably uh, multiple forums being used to to discuss these requirements because I don't see diff being the experts on the legal and human experience possibly. So you might be using my data, for example, for one part, you might Contera for another, and then I'll be there for yeah. the standards input because the, the standards needs a clear uh, implementation uh, ideas. Of, yeah what could influence, and, and I'm trying to cover that under this project. Absolutely. Um, so great. I've seen that we've lost most people. <laughs> yeah. but, uh, we rolled the hour six minutes ago. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, uh, but it's great that some people did. The stragglers hung out here on a Friday for some of us, <laughs> getting late for some, yeah. Well, oh, great. great. Uh, thanks, thanks, Appreciate thanks, it. Jan, for putting this together, for herding cats uh, and and directing traffic and MC and for making this happen. This is all great work, and uh, yeah. it's a welcome addition to the to the archive here. 